The Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldridge by Philip K. Dick. Words fail when attempting to describe this book because this is one of the most, perhaps the most, WTF book I've ever read. Uh, I read this book cover to cover and I have not the faintest idea of what it all meant or whether it even made sense. And I think that is the intended effect, but man, this book throws you for loop after loop. So bear with me as I attempt to articulate my feelings regarding the three stigmata of Palmer Eldridge. Okay, so Philip K. Dick, if you don't know, is one of my favorite writers. I think he did more for the advancement of the science fiction genre than pretty much any other author, except maybe Heinlein and Ursula K. Le Guin. Uh, they did too, but I think, I think Philip K. Dick really took it beyond what it was. And I don't think it was really recognized so much at the time of, the, of his own life just how much he did but it certainly is now and he's been one of my he's been one of my favorite authors for years now and i'm slowly kind of working my way through his uh, catalog and i'd wanted to read the three stigmata of palmer eldridge for quite some time now because i had heard that it's a one of his best and also pretty much universally regarded as his most outlandish and what the heck did I just read kind of uh, works. And having read it, I wholeheartedly agree. I think this absolutely is one of his best. It is also one of his most philosophically rich works. And it's also one of the weirdest, uh, most mind-blowing um, things that I've ever read. And it's an experience, okay? It is a trip. It, it is quite literally a trip. So what is the three stigmata of Palmer Eldridge about? Uh, well, first of all, if you don't know what stigmata is, it is a term usually uh, associated with uh, Catholicism, and it means uh, usually the manifestation of a wound or mark on the body which corresponds to cruci the crucifixion wounds that Jesus uh, would have sustained on the cross. This can um, be anything from a bleeding scalp, from a, you know, an invisible crown of thorns, or a wounded side where the spear went in, or a hole through the hand. Now, that's not exactly what the actual word stigmata means and it's not really what it what dick uses it here as uh that's just what we use it mostly in our current life as but what i think it means at its very heart is the physical manifestation in a human of an aspect of the divine that's i think what it basically means in its most you know basic sense and that's really what Philip K. Dick uses it here because there are no, you know, crucifixion scars. There are no crowns of thorns or anything. Uh, but it definitely does deal with the divine or the perhaps not so divine manifesting through uh, mortals. But anyway, so and also we need to it should not be overlooked the significance of the name Palmer Eldridge because the word Eldridge means weird and sinister and foreboding. And that definitely very much fits the character in this book. So uh, this book, as with the vast majority of Philip K. Dick's uh, output, this is a science fiction novel set in what was at the time of its writing the distant future of, I think, the 21st century, which is pretty much just what we're living through now. So it has that kind of um, the, the Jetsons kind of retro futuristic outlook. There's flying cars, there's laser guns, there's all this, you know, fantastical crap that they thought we would have by the year 2000, none of which we actually have. So, I mean, it does show its age as with pretty much all of Philip K. Dick's books in like a technical sense. It does just show its age contextually, I mean. But don't let that 
uh, don't think that that diminishes its value. But anyway, so it takes place in basically close to our current time period, I think. Um, humanity has colonized by necessity, has had to colonize the solar system because Earth's climate, and this is a little bit prescient, I think, the, uh, the issue of the climate on Earth has bottomed out. It is now uh, global warming. It's more like global boiling because in uh, the daytime hours, you can't even go outside because you will literally just fry like an egg on the sidewalk. I think it says something like the temperatures at noon reach like 180 degrees outside. Um, not at all to, you know, you know, uh, not at all to speak lightly of global warming, but I don't think even the most uh, even the most ardent of climatologists would tell you that that would ever really be a threat uh, of, of uh, occurring on planet Earth, that global temperatures reaching almost 200 degrees. I don't think even the most um, outspoken of climate scientists would tell you that is something that you need to worry about happening. But in this, in the world of this book, it does. Earth is uh, wrecked. The UN, which is now the sole governing body of the planet Earth, has um, dr like draft people, like you know, a military draft, to go to the other planets in the solar system, or the other habitable planets at least, and colonize them because you gotta have some new, not so environmentally destroyed uh, ter territory. So. Uh, and these colonists on these other planets, it is not an easy life because uh, anytime you're creating a new colony, whether it be on, you know, Roanoke Island or um, in, on the American frontier or wherever, anywhere you're trying to colonize some place, it's generally not very easy and it can be rough. And so on these planets, and much of the action of this book takes place on Mars, um, uh, on these planets, the life sucks so badly that the colonists have had to resort to the ingestion of a mystical drug entitled Candy. I think that's a play on the word candy, literally can-d. Um, and it, what it does is it, and I'm going to have to cover a lot of ground because there is a lot happening in this 233-page book. So, uh, just to go through the, mo the motion, the colonists on these planets ingest this drug called Candy, which allows them to share in a communal out-of-body experience, which is mostly, which is pretty much given to be hallucinatory in nature, and it's also very transient. But it's the only thing that makes the life of, a, of an uh, interplanetary pioneer bearable, is this drug. But as it just so happens, a... a um, a prospector, I suppose, named the titular Palmer Eldritch has just returned from deep space bearing a new drug called Chu Z, and that's the word Chu dash the letter Z, uh, which is better, supposedly, than can be and allows for much more intense and visceral hallucinations, which may not actually be hallucinations, which may in fact be the transferring of one, one's consciousness to an entirely different reality that is actually real and not a hallucination. So now there is, and you know, because all these, all these, um, all these Philip K. Dick books involve mega corporations vying for power in the economic landscape of the distant future. Um, the company that manufactures Candy is now trying to undercut Palmer Eldritch and his new company, which sells Choosy, but in trying to, you know, maintain their monopoly on the, the interplanetary drug trade. So, in the course of this, several characters, this book had a large cast of characters, too, and all of them were actually pretty well handled, I thought, but I'll get to that. Anyway, so in the course of that, um, some characters do some stuff, including corporate espionage, and as it eventually is revealed, Palmer Eldritch is not actually a man, but some kind of quasi-divine entity from somewhere else who is trying to replicate itself through inhabiting the minds of the people that it distributes the new drug to, and is trying to basically take over the universe. But it's not made clear whether that's even actually such a malicious thing. 
And this book ends on perhaps the most ambiguous note I have ever seen a book end. And ambiguity is really just the word of the day when it comes to the three stigmata of Palmer Eldridge, because I don't really know what to make of any of this. But I think that there is something that can be made of it, because I don't, I, Philip K. Dick was not the kind of author who wrote in books that didn't really have a, a, a something to be uncovered. Uh, I, I think this really is one of those puzzle box, puzzle box kind of books where if you give it enough thought and you think it through and you go through its logic very meticulously, I think you actually can uncover a concrete meaning to this or a message, if you will. Um, I think this this book, perhaps more than any other book by Philip K. Dick, perhaps more than any other book by Philip K. Dick, it merits reading and rereading and rereading because it's wild. <laughs> to say the least. But um, let me just talk about the writing and the characters and then the message so I can, you know, oh, and let, to, to rate the three stigmata of Palmer Eldridge, I would rate this pretty highly. I don't, this is definitely a B plus book. Okay. This, I don't know if it breaks over into the A minus range, but it's definitely a high B. Um, and I think it is absolutely one of, maybe not Philip K. Dick's best. I think I think his best is probably still The Man in the High Castle, but um, it's definitely among his best and his most thought-provoking. Absolutely. And to rate it, I think I would give it. A, a, I think I would give it a B plus. But um, the writing in this, Philip K. Dick was never a, a wordsmith. Um, that's not to say that his writing is clumsy or inept at all. It is not. It's just pretty workmanlike and just kind of direct. He's not at all trying to play any kind of games with the, his diction or the way the sentences are constructed. It's very direct, simple narration writing. I mean, um, he's not going to blow you away in terms of the prose, but it's more than serviceable. I mean, it, it gets the, it's, it's, it's not really ever redundant. It's very clear and concise, and it gets the job done. I will say, I think he uses semicolons a whole lot more than is actually necessary in this book. He, he, is a, he was a big fan, I think, of the semicolon. Uh, he uses that a lot in this book, a lot. Like, there is hardly a sentence in this book that doesn't have one, two, or sometimes three semicolons in it. I think, uh, but that's not really, I guess, a flaw. But the characters in this book were actually pretty good. You know, I think I've mentioned previously that Philip K. Dick really wasn't the best character writer either, but he did pretty good in this book, I think. He did pretty good, especially the main characters. The I guess the protagonist of the work, if you will, is the, a character named Barney Mayerson, and he was actually pretty well rendered. And the supporting cast, and you'll have to, you know, pardon me, because the cast of this book, this slim little book, because Philip K. Dick, I don't think he ever wrote a book that talked maybe like 325 pages. Like, he was a pretty breezy writer. His books were pretty, they, they're usually not very much over 200 pages. The, the vast majority of them aren't over that in length. But in this one book, the cast of characters is pretty big, but they're handled pretty well, actually, I think, especially Barney, I guess, the main character. And Palmer Eldridge is a, a that's something. And this book actually, beyond just being a science fiction book, I think this book actually can qualify as cosmic Lovecraftian horror just a little bit. There is this element of horror to it, but there's not really much in the way of outright malice. Uh, the the events, uh, Palmer Eldridge is kind of set up to be this villainous, inhuman thing masquerading as a human, trying to take over the minds of the entire human race. But it's never clear whether that's act, where it's whether that's whether he's intended to be viewed as evil. There's not really much moralizing done in the way of the, the events that this story uh, depicts. And so it leaves it, once again, very ambiguous as to how you're meant to take any of this. And uh, But the characters, I think, are pretty good. Um, the messages of this book, and this is where we get, I don't know that I'm qualified to talk about this because I don't even know that I understood 
I didn't understand hardly anything in this book. But the messages as I saw them, uh, Philip K. Dick was a practitioner of a very unique and, in, in fact, pretty much unique unto him, I think, branch of Gnostic Christianity. And I think that's pretty on display in here, especially towards the end. Uh, there is a definite vein of Gnosticism in this book. And if you don't know what Gnosticism is, you can look that up. It is, a, It was, and to a lesser extent still is, a branch of philosophical slash religious thought that posits that the entity which we take to be God, oftentimes the biblical Christian God is actually the creation of a much more... Uh, a much more a much more powerful and much generally considered a much more beneficent being which is behind the scenes of everything and that what we think of in in terms of our religion is actually an illusion uh perpetrated by this entity called the demiurge which um is trying to you know it's it's complicated and you can look up if you want to know what gnosticism is just look it up because i it, i mean you know, there are websites that can explain it better than I can. But I think that that is a major theme in here because Palmer Eldridge, who we initially take at the onset of the story just to be a man, um, is gradually revealed over the course of the book to not be human. He may have been human at one point, but now he has been um, inhabited, if you will, by some decidedly inhuman thing. And... Uh, so they're in this thing is immensely powerful because um, the drug that these people take called Chu Z allows this entity to craft myriad different entire realities, dream worlds kind of um, into, I, I don't even know, that's how weird this book is. But it also really toys again, you know, you know, Philip K. Dick was a big, um, he was he was he was really big on the idea of alternate universes and parallel realities. You can see this in major display in *The Man in the High Castle*, which has, has one of my favorite books ever, and I still think that's his best. You can also see this on display in to a lesser well, to a lesser extent in um, *Flow My Tears*. The policeman said also a good one, and in *Ubik*, kind of in *Ubik*. I don't really like *Ubik*. I'll have to do a review on that book as well because I don't. I'm in the minority because I don't really like you, but I don't think it's quite as good as everybody says it is. Um, and this book is very similar in tone to, or very similar in its content, I suppose, to "Flow My Tears." The policeman said there is a lot of carryover between those two books, and uh, basically the the mind or something or someone or something's mind being able to project entire different realities and that reality itself basically being the product of a mind um whether that be a god or whether that just be someone tripping balls on uh some acid or whatnot there is uh, a lot of uh, carryover between these two books and the way it handles parallel realities because the people who take this drug are both the drugs Candy and dr the drug Choosy are transported to different realities. The drug that the, the drug Candy, the, ori the original initial drug, is just creates a, basically a, a shared hallucination that people can participate in communally. Whereas Choosy literally creates like a whole other universe that people can inhabit separately. And so there's also some talk, there's also debate between, I guess it's just basically Dick talking to himself um, about the merits and demerits of communal religious experience and individual religious experience because uh, Christianity is a communal religion. It is all about the losing of oneself in a higher power to be subsumed by the divine and giving yourself over to something bigger and in that regard it's about many people basically becoming one uh i think and i'm not too too 
familiar with the pra the practices of Buddhism, but I think Buddhism is kind of more of an individual religion. It's about each individual trying to attain a higher level of reality, a higher level of being, and about trying to overcome this world's, you know, limitations and stuff. And I don't, and it's about them trying to, you know, escape the cycle of, you know, whatnot. Uh, I don't think it's so nearly so much communal in its um, philosophy as Christianity is. And so I think there's some interesting um, comparing and contrasting and juxtaposing in this book between the more communal religion religions versus the more individual uh, um, separate religion, religious experience at least. And that's really interesting stuff. But, and again, uh, Dick never tells you what to make out of any of this, whether that be thematically or um, even in the plot. Because, again, when you get to the end of this book, and it's so hard, I know I've probably done a poor job of conveying what this book is about, but when you get to the end of this book, you're not really sure what has happened. I, I don't, I, I mean, I just, I just finished this book and I don't know what it's about at all. Uh, I don't know how much is real. I don't even know if it made sense. See, well, that's partly why I don't really like his novel Ubik so much, even though that's one of his most highly regarded, because I don't think that book really makes any sense if you actually apply logic to it. And The Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldridge is a book where I don't really know if it makes any sense or not, it could go either way, honestly. Like it's this is you know they say some books just can't be filmed. That there are some stories that can only exist in the mind and cannot be um, portrayed in a physical medium, a visual medium such as film. And I think the Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch really might fall into that category because this book can go either way. You can, I, I mean, it, it can it teeters on the edge of making no sense whatsoever and making perfect sense like depending on how much you buy into its premise and how much how deeply you you know apply logic to it 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 teeters on whether it's nonsensical or stunningly or a stunning product of perfect narrative execution and i really don't know but it was a heck of a ride and it's it leaves you unsettled uh, that's why I say that this could also be categorized as like um, cosmic horror because it definitely leaves you unsettled after you read it. Uh, and I think that was the intended effect because the recurrent theme throughout Philip K. Dick's body of work is that the que it's the questioning of what is real and what is not. And nowhere, I suppose, is that more apparent than in this because you don't know what is real and what is not. And after you have completed reading the book, it, that effect kind of bleeds out a little bit into the actual world because you're like, what, what, what is real? What, what is, what is unreal? What is, and what is just illusion? Now that may sound pretentious and, you know, like, um, a, a, a college freshman that, um, took a philosophy, an intro to philosophy class and then smoked a joint and was like, we're all just dust in the wind, man. Uh, I don't mean it to sound that way, but when you do finish reading this book and you put it down and you just sit there and think a little bit, uh, it, it will draw you into its way of thinking and it doesn't really want to let you go. It kind of, it does unsettle you, definitely. I think that is a high mark in its favor because this book was, I don't know that it was perfect, um, but I think it is probably about as close to perfection as Philip K. Dick ever got. So, yeah. And, uh, also the three, the titular three stigmata of Palmer Eldridge are the arm, the teeth, and the eyes. Um, and that's why I want to just make that distinction that although we use the term stigmata in our world today, usually to refer to, um, crucifixion wounds manifesting on true believers, on the bodies of true believers, even though I don't know how, you know, verifiable any of that is, 
uh, ever happening, but I mean, it's a pretty big thing in Catholicism, I think, but it's not, that's not exactly the way that Philip K. Dick is using it in here. Palmer Eldridge in this book has an artificial arm. He has um, artificial teeth and artificial eyes. And these are the things that begin manifesting in the different characters uh, after they take the drug in this nominally real world. Because after you take the drug, you no longer know whether you're in the real world or what even can be categorized as real. Maybe all the worlds depicted in this book are real uh, to the people that are taking the drug. And after you take it uh, and you are basically, you're literally in Palmer Eldridge's world after you take the Chu Z. And um, so you, the, the, the divine begins manifesting in the mortal in these alternate realities and it's a, it is a head trip of a book this is absolutely this may be the trippiest thing i've ever read i mean i've read some real trips i have a lot of them philip k dick books but i don't think he ever topped this in terms of what the heck did i just read because i don't know what the heck i just read all i know is that it was one heck of a ride it was enjoyable although i will say it was a bit of a slow start this book this edition of this book is uh, 233 pages. It's not a long book, but it didn't really get going until about the 100 page mark. There, this was a slow start to the book, and I really wasn't sure how much I was going to like it uh, when I first started. When I first started, I was kind of like, "This isn't really his strongest effort." But once it, once you pass that 100, that 100 page mark it really takes off and it really does become an experience. And I really do think this is probably one of his best works. Uh, so, The Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldridge. Have you read The Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldridge? If you have, definitely, I, I'm, I'm pleading with you. If you have, let me know down in the comments what you thought about it and what your interpretation of it was, uh, because I could definitely use some help in that regard because I don't really know what to make of this novel. But if you have not read The Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldridge and you are a fan of Philip K. Dick, uh, definitely, definitely read this book because it is one of his finest and it is definitely one of his trippiest and most um, high concept, absolutely. Um, and if you're just interested in science fiction at all, this is a fantastic example of the genre doing well, <laughs> doing very well. Um, it's a little dated in terms of its uh, concepts, like the flying cars and the laser guns and stuff. It's literally just like something out of the Jetsons or Lost in Space or something. So it's a little quaint in that regard. But the themes of it, the underlying messages of it are timeless, and I think that uh, it has aged pretty well, all things considered. And as always, if you have enjoyed anything you've seen or heard here today, remember to like, subscribe, help the channel out a little bit. I would deeply appreciate it. And until next time, peace.